it's not. Uh, there, there are many facets to each of each such uh, incident that happens. Agreed. And to add on to that, Hans, Hono Ulu Uli is located in Eva, and there's still uh, many plantation homes all around there. Um, and there's many, many history over there through all the plantation. Thank you, Jacob. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit what part of the ship we are currently looking at and what structure we may be? seeing right now i think we're um we're just we're continuing to move forward along the the side i think we're just below where um the mounts for some of the anti-aircraft guns were um and we'll be getting towards um the stack and then eventually uh where where the uh the island was but i think if we're if we're at this level the whole way you know that that was far above anything that's that's preserved here, um, and most of that debris is going to be on the sea floor where the attack happened, not here. So um, I'm not actually really sure what we're going to see. We might we might just have hull that looks like this with a lot of the decks torn off, uh, and then get to the bow. Um, we, we will see. Okay, okay. And can you give me a rough idea how far the this location is from the place of original place of attack? I'm not actually sure about okay. that. Okay. I, don't, I don't know where that site is. Thank you. And an update for viewers that have been tuning in and out. Um, were we able to find any um, identifiable um, pieces of wreckage in the debris field uh, from Akagi yesterday? Are there things that you're similarly hoping or expecting to find in the debris field of right. Kaga today? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, sorry. Um, uh, just an update for some of our viewers who are tuning in and tuning out and also trying to get some rest. Um, were there any identifiable pieces of wreckage identified um, from looking at the debris field from Akagi the other day? And then um, are there things you're looking for specifically in the debris field today? Well, we didn't find anything particularly diagnostic in the debris field. Um, we're looking more at the features of the uh, of the hull, um, the overall length, the casemate guns that we saw a few minutes ago, uh, the the shape of the bow and the stern, the locate. Well, on Akagi, the location of the the stack and the island uh, were identifiable. Here, we're not going to see that because it's it's probably very, uh, gone. But those are some of the features we're looking at uh, to to tie to the site. Okay, so it sounds like the identifying features are really still on the ship and the debris field is kind of a, an additional survey to kind of see um, what's around it. Well, the debris field for this site is actually uh, quite a distance off the bow. Um, it, it's not uh, right next to it. Uh, okay, thank you for that clarification. So this is the third wreck site that we are visiting. And from a very amateur point of view, from what I have seen, it uh, I, over, I cannot probably specify, but it seems to me that the structure, the engineering, and the design of the ships, the Japanese ships, are quite different 
from USS Yorktown that we saw on the first uh, wreck dive. So can you probably elucidate a little bit more on the details of why and how the sh build of the ships were different and uh, why they were different? Were there different strategies that each of uh, these uh, ships were more specified for or uh, why do we see such differences? Well, the, the main difference was um, that the uh, Yorktown was built as an aircraft carrier and these two ships, Kaga and Akagi, mm -hmm. were built as, this one was initially laid down as a battleship, Yes. Akagi was laid down as a cruiser, okay. and then later, once they were being built, they were later uh, added the flight decks to make okay. them into aircraft carriers, so the they weren't built that way ground up, but Hiryu and Soryu and a few other later uh, Japanese aircraft carriers were designed as aircraft carriers. Uh, they also had a unique uh, way of positioning the uh, the islands and their yes. the smokestacks. The so smokestacks, yes. Yeah. Can I step in for a second, Mike? Yeah. Um, are you good with a one zero move bearing three two five? Uh, three two five to parallel the wreck. Yeah, but still be a little offset. Yeah, that's good. Can we please step one zero meters bearing three two five? Thank you. didn't mean to yeah. interrupt your great dialogue there. Sorry, Pasha. That's absolutely fine. Oh, that's a very good question. And it, I think it's my impression, and I'd have to, you know, ask our short team experts or Mike uh, about this, but it would seem that, you know, once you build a battle cruiser or a battleship, it's not like you can go in and pull down a few two by four studs and remake your house it's it's a pretty solidly built vessel so they're adding you know multiple hangar decks on top raising it higher and higher up and ultimately the multiple flight decks uh, are converted to a single flight deck but still then this had to be taller than a purpose-built carrier with one flight deck like the Yorktown were these quite a bit taller? Or John on science chat? Or Phil or Russ? Is, is that guess anywhere correct? I'm not sure. What's that? Standing by.
Oh, right now. I'm science left. Thanks, Russ, on the chat, and John. Yeah, the double hangar decks ended up making things quite a bit taller. The flight deck, uh, Kaganakagi, or I'm not sure which one, maybe both, 65 feet above the water line. That's considerable. That's pretty um, fascinating, then, what we're seeing here. Most of the, mm -hmm. the hole must be buried. Um, you said that we're seeing here right here is where the the decks were ripped off correct yeah most of that 65 feet is gone yeah on this site but an answer to the other part of your question Vipassana is that their purpose their function of course is is very similar and very singular to carry the greatest amount of of aircraft yes into attacking range as mm -hmm. they could And do we know in comparison, so uh, Akagi and Kaga were quite tall at, you said 65 feet above the waterline? Do we know approximately um, what might have been a more typical height? Or maybe how tall U.S.'s Yorktown was from yeah. the waterline? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Yep. Yep. Nav, how's our move doing? Yeah, we're about halfway through the last move. Okay, thanks. And I think Mike explained this over SPL, um, but yeah, so we put in a ship movement and then that was done, even though it was 10 meters. And then it's, take, it's been taking about, yeah, 10 or 15 minutes to complete a 10 meter move from the surface all the way down to 5,433 meters where Atalanta is. 
which is approximately a little over three miles. So very, 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 very deep and very long line. everyone. Daniel and I joining back here from the back row once more. Welcome back, Megan. Thank you. Uh, Megan and Daniel, would you like to introduce yourselves as well? Sure. Always happy to. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Cook. I am the co-expedition leader of this expedition, which is my enormous privilege. Um, I have such a deep love and respect for Papa Hanamu Kuakea, so the opportunity to be part of a team here and certainly the chance to be part of leading a team here um, is just one of the the privileges of my career, the privileges of my life. Um, when I'm not on Nautilus, I am the director of ocean Ex uh, uh, director of education and outreach for Ocean Exploration Trust. I'm really privileged to have been part of this team for 11 years, with sailing with Nautilus around the world. Uh, first, my love for oceans and animals, and then eventually uh, moving that love into, you know, my heart really being in connecting people to stories of the ocean and bringing them to places like this. So, um, yeah, I've just been so impressed by the team day after day uh, as we've been here on this expedition in honoring this place and holding it and holding space, looking out for each other as we do this hard work of visiting these places, but this really important work of um, connecting with each other and connecting with the world and connecting with the history and bringing people to this place. And I get to work beside the tremendously talented uh, Daniel Wagner, who's here for his intro. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, aloha, Mike Alko. Konnichiwa. Good morning, good evening, uh, good day, wherever you are. It's an absolute privilege to be with you. Uh, my name is Daniel Wagner. I am uh, alongside Megan. I've uh, been given the privilege to lead the, this uh, very special um, expedition to the Papahanaumu Kuakea Marine National Monument and um, been given the enormous honor to assemble uh, part of this team here on shore and on the ship uh, to help achieve the scientific objectives of the mission. Uh, when I'm not on the exploration vessel Nautilus, I serve as the chief scientist for the Ocean Exploration Trust. Uh, we have uh, expeditions uh, most of the year. Uh, this year alone, we have eight expeditions, so we're about midway through the season. And so I, I get to uh, work on the science planning and execution and reporting of all of our expeditions. Uh, this year alone, we'll uh, be bringing the ship uh, throughout the central, eastern, uh, Pacific, covering tremendous amount of ground and going to some of the most remote and special places uh, here in this big, big ocean that covers one third of our planet. So it's an absolute honor and privilege to be with you and to share uh, some of the lessons that we're learning and the new information that we're learning on this mission with all of you. So glad to be here. Thank you, Megan and Daniel. Hans, with the regular holes there in that metal ahead, is that some kind of deck plating? What are we looking at? Yeah, you know, I mentioned that, that we archaeologists have a lot of code names for things that uh, we can't immediately identify, but some sort of strapping or support material, and oftentimes they'll drill holes in metal frames and pieces simply to save weight. 
if you don't need the weight of the entire piece and it can be done to save a little weight, they'll, they'll drill holes in it. Some sort of attachment or flashing along the side of the deck? Uh, not sure. Also, give us that give us that overview. Where do we find ourselves now on the wreck, and uh, which direction are we headed? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Our, our initial descent was made on the on the port side, and uh, we moved towards the stern. We moved aft along the port side, and rounded the stern, and found that a significant part of the fantail deck and and the very aft portion of the ship itself is missing. It's no longer there or covered. It, we couldn't see that. And then we're proceeding up the starboard side, beginning at the stern and moving forward. We've passed the uh, casemate guns, the large 20 centimeter guns. There were five of them on each side in the aft section uh, of the vessel and low down to the mud line and we've been passing underneath the positions of the some of the anti-aircraft guns which were much higher up on the hull nearer to the flight deck but those all that all those elevations and levels above us are no longer here in the wreck so we're approaching midships on the starboard side the right side of the vessel when looking forward and we're slowly making our way towards the bow Thank you, Hans, so much for the description. Uh, can you uh, tell us a bit more about where most of the damage had happened on this ship? On which part of the ship? And that uh, correlates with the extensive amount of damage that we are seeing in certain parts of the... certain ends of the ship. Well, I can attempt to. Uh, because unlike the uh, Akagi, which received a single thousand pound bomb somewhere in the midsection, the Kaga received four, at least four, maybe five, possibly even more direct deck hits uh, of 500 pound bombs, at least 1,000 pound bomb into the flight deck. And as we know... Can I cut in for a second, Hans? Yes, go ahead, Mia. I just want to... Uh Ask if you guys are ready for yep, one zero ready. move. All right. Go ahead, Hans. Thank you. Thanks, Mia. And so, as we know, you know the the Japanese carriers were in the process of rearming their planes to make a second attack on Midway Atoll. And uh, when they finally learned of the presence of at least one American carrier in the vicinity, they rescinded that decision and began arming to attack the carrier. But all of this change, refueling, rearming with torpedoes, with armor-piercing bombs rather than uh, bombs meant to attack an atoll, takes time. And it means there's a lot of ordnance on the hangar decks and a lot of active fuel lines, and that's not the situation you want to be in if you're expecting enemy planes to arrive. That's why it was so volatile to be struck by even a single bomb on the Akagi, by that thousand pound bomb. And in this case, we have four, five, possibly more direct hits, two forward, one midships, and one hit aft on the flight deck. And with so much ordnance already in, an, in the hangar decks, uh, it ignited fires, it broke the aviation gas lines, the gas and air mixture in the enclosed hangars itself became explosive. And so I don't know that I could point to any single area of the ship and say that more damage was done here rather than there. I think it's just massively damaged along a, along a probably large, the entire length large of portion. The... And, and that's what we're seeing here. We're not seeing any place yet that has any hangar structure left at all. It's truly impressive 
and devastating. Absolutely. just want to provide a quick uh, update on the plans ahead. Uh, so uh, the plans are basically this evening, uh, whenever we're done with a, a comprehensive and thorough survey of the Kaga, uh, circumventing the wreck and completing all the zoom-ins of all the key locations, whenever that's completed, uh, likely around 8 o'clock or so Hawaii time, uh, we'll pull the ROVs off the seafloor and then begin the three-hour ascent to the surface here. Uh, we'll then complete um, about a 14-hour mapping survey, uh, mapping towards the northwestern end of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. There is one uh, particular seamount in that very northwestern corner that had remained unmapped, and uh, we'll be mapping that overnight and through tomorrow afternoon. Uh, and then around 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, I'll uh, be doing the very first dive on that seamount. Uh, has a summit predicted around 800 meters, uh, has never been sampled or surveyed visually. Uh, and so that will be the dive then. Uh, and then over the next two weeks, well, the expedition will still be underway. We'll be slowly working our way back, uh, surveying uh, about a half a dozen or so seamounts uh, that have never been surveyed or sampled here in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. A lot of these seamounts are off the axis of the northwestern ridge, so they were not formed over the Hawaiian hotspot. Uh, and so uh, big uh, purpose or objective of those dives is to understand how old they are and where they formed, since they do not form over the Hawaiian hotspot. Uh, but also understanding the rich uh, biodiversity that is found on these old seamounts. So these are 80 to 100 million years old targeting a lot of places where we expect to find uh, very dense and diverse communities of fishes and vertebrates. And so uh, there's a lot still to come in the next two weeks while this Ala Aumuana Kaiuli expedition is underway, uh, culminating on September 28th when we pulled back into port in Honolulu. Uh, and then there's still a lot more exploration to come. Uh, four more expeditions uh -huh. that will take uh, Ibi Nautilus around uh, the main Hawaiian Islands as well as as far back as uh, Jarvis Atoll in the South Pacific uh, and we'll end our season right before Christmas uh, to end a, what's been a really remarkable season already and still a lot more to come. Uh, so we hope that you all can join us as we explore some of these truly extraordinary places throughout the Pacific Ocean. Without a doubt, and I want to clarify for some of our viewers, you know, um, if you're just joining this dive, this is an unusual view for us to be diving with a single ROV, ROV Atalanta. You can see the motion of the ship in these camera views. This is um, one ROV uh, at the base of a armored cable, a 6-8 cable, bobbing up and down. Often as we explore, we explore with a dual body ROV. Generally, all of our dives are that way. So connected from this ROV would be a second, the ROV Hercules or little Hercules beneath. I uh, really want to give compliments, triumph to the team, the perseverance and uh, troubleshooting and just continuing to find a way forward. As we were out here, we had intended to dive these dives with ROV little Hercules in our normal two body ROV configuration with these two ROVs capable of reaching these depths. Uh, we are almost a mile deeper than we generally explore with the ROV Hercules and their depth rating. So as you come down here beyond 17,000 feet, uh, it takes special ROVs, special technologies to make it here. As we return to our seamount targets, we'll return more to our the depths we may be familiar with, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 meters beneath, and we'll uh, bring Hercules back, that brings our sampling capability back and our chance to um, see the seafloor in these different ways. So 
really thankful to have the technology to access this realm and access this space. Um, as a result, and of course in accordance with uh, just the supreme respect these places deserve, um, these are visual only dives, no, no interaction with the site, no sampling, um, just gathering this imagery from which a lot of science can be done, um, but certainly are uh, following international archaeology best practice and our policies always, uh, no interaction with the site here. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Tis. So the, the mission is really to leave the site with nothing but a better understanding and respect for these sites. Absolutely. Yeah, if you were a comment about um, the, the pace of the exploration, so hopefully that helps explain a little. Um, ROV Atalanta is dangling at the end of almost 5,500 meters of cable. Um, in order to move Atalanta, we have to move the ship, and that motion has to translate all the way down that wire. Um, and of course, we want to be moving very slowly and deliberately. So we're making small calculated movements. You may be hearing the navigator, Mia, and the ROV pilots in the front row, having that discussion back and forth. Uh, so we are gathering data at the speed of light. We are seeing those video feeds and sending commands down to the ROVs um, in, in, you know, sub-second instantaneous command of the vehicles, but uh, moving them around requ requires this, you know, I sometimes think of it a little like robot ballet, you know, these um, multiple systems all in close coordination. Yeah, I think Mia had a great analogy about it the other day. Um, basically, Atalanta's on the end of a very, very long rope, and if you've ever... Sorry, what was that? Um, if you've ever seen, can, like... Can, can you, can you oh. hold on one second oh, yeah, here, please? Sorry. Front row, you're not on SPL, if you mean to be. Sorry, can you start that again? Yeah, so far. Go ahead, Kara. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, no worries, and thank you. This is actually um, your analogy, Mia, so. Thank um, you. <laughs> basically, uh, Mia was explaining the other day, it's like a, um, if you've ever seen one of those like really heavy ropes that people use in um, their workouts at a gym where they like just swing these heavy ropes around and it, uh, you see that wave pass through that rope as they lift and uh, move it around. It's kind of like that, but imagine this wave moving through the rope all the way from the surface of the ocean down to, you know, over 5,000 meters. So it just takes a while for that motion to be translated. So I thought that was a very good visual in my head. Thank you, Kara. I was trying to think of something that would relate to the audience. We had a question earlier about the distance between the carriers that we have been at so far, USS Yorktown, Akagi, and Kaga. Um, so just want to note that uh, these sites are very far apart from each other because the battle encompassed a huge area. Um, they were fighting at uh, approximately 50 to 150 miles apart and often could not see each other. Um, so. Uh, even though we've been able to do these dives, we have been transiting between these sites for uh, several hours at a time. So they are a little bit farther apart from each other. So, yes, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a, an important, you know, envisioning of this battle that the carriers never saw one another. Um, only by launching their aircraft and interacting, you know, after hours of flying in many cases to, to find and scout the other's location. Um, is how this battle took place. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a it's an impressive analogy. And then across across four days, this battlefield also moved. So many of the events, including um, the bombing here of Jap Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga that we're looking at, um, happened on June 4th. But events obviously leading up to that day and 
engagements across the subsequent three days um, moved back and forth over hundreds and hundreds of, of miles of ocean areas as these uh, different carrier groups both launched attacks that also defended themselves moving as fast as 30 knots you know dodging bombs falling from the sky in some cases so um, you know a, a dynamic landscape or seascape um, although you know we may have visited different battlefields on land depending where you are in the world how those are memorialized uh, in the ocean harder to see those those tracks and those places so Mia, how's our move coming? We have about four meters left, I think, in this move. Um, we just did a 10 meter move at 300 degrees. 300? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you wanna do 10 or 15, but stick with 10. Bridge nav. Can we please step one zero meters at a bearing of 300 degrees? Thank you so much. That's a good point about the dynamic nature of the maritime battlefield. It is a battlefield nonetheless, but usually unseen. It's an unseen battlefield for the most part, until now, until technology like this uh, and the capacity that vessels like Nautilus bring. And an important point regarding the mobility of these ships during the battle is, you know, they're not sunk where they were attacked. That's very important. Some people might wonder, you know, are we going to see some of the planes around them they were attacked, you know, planes were shot down. Not necessarily because they, they drifted for quite a while, sometimes for, for days. Um, the crews fought valiantly to save their ships, to suppress the fires. And when that couldn't be done, then evacuation was made. So nobody, none of the survivors were on these ships when they went down. They were scuttled, and that's a term for intentionally sending a ship to the bottom. Um, these aircraft carriers were scuttled by their own destroyers, by Japanese destroyers with torpedoes, once it was clear that there was no way to tow them back to Japan for repair. Yeah, thanks for those details, Hans, and um, learning about this event myself, too. I, it's been kind of... Um, um, helping my understanding and the timeline because sometimes when you're learning history it just seems like everything's happening at a steady pace but actually there's um, really intense moments where things happen so quickly like I believe uh, the aircraft carriers um, multiple Japanese aircraft carriers were all bombed in a very small window right within um, like five minutes or ten minutes or something like that but then they were burning for very very um, a long time after that so yeah the the first three so kaga was hit first and then akagi and soryu quickly after that and then it was later in the day that hiryu which had escaped the first wave uh was was hit and that since hiryu which which turned north um was the only japanese carrier that wasn't on fire uh, after the first at uh, attack um it was those the ki the aircraft from hiryu that bombed Yorktown twice um, with bombs and aerial torpedoes. They managed to put out the fires right or correct for some of the list uh, and get it underway again, get the power back and the engines going uh, twice when, and then um, that's when the Japanese submarine I-168 uh, fired the torpedoes that eventually sank Yorktown. So yeah, there, there were like punctuated moments throughout four days, most of which happened on the fourth, which is the first day. But then it can, you know, continued for for multiple days after that. So, the majority of the Battle of Midway was one day, but it, it kind of uh, actions continued for for three more days. Thanks for that, Mike. It really helps to um, better have a uh, understanding of the timeline of, of events.
That's a great question for our pilots. Dan, are you available to answer a question? Oh, Jacob, if you want to take a shot at it, maybe? Yeah, I'm listening. Awesome. If you're interested if the tether travels down in more or less a straight line, or if it has a curve, could you talk to us about what shape we think the 6-8 is making right now and what kind of factors influence that? Um, I couldn't speak to whether it has a curve, but I imagine it's uh, very much like a bowstring. But uh, Atlanta is currently about 80 meters away from uh, the launch point on the back of Nautilus, so you can do the math and figure out what the angle of the umbilical is going through the water column. Well, that's, a middle, that's an awesome middle school algebra there for at home, 80 meters away, horizontally, and 5,500 meters away, I vertically. Fa I failed math, but I believe that's a trick question. <laughs> Here's a calculator. <laughs> I have an app for that. I can tell you it's less than one degree. Yeah, I think one another key p piece of information that most people don't realize is just the weight of the cable itself. So when we got spooled out close to 5,500 meters, it was about two pounds per meter. So we got close to 11,000 pounds just of wire out there. So that creates a lot of tension just in itself. And then obviously any kind of currents in the water will put some drag on that. Yeah, when diving with ROV Hercules, we intentionally have an, a curve shape in the cable, not in the heavy armored cable, the 6.8 cable, which we call it the 6.8 cable because it is 0.68 of an inch uh, in diameter. A very interesting, interesting dimension. Um, <laughs> but in the tether that would connect on a different dive from ROV Atalanta to Hercules, it has both floats and weights on it to keep that uh, neutrally buoyant tether in a S shape, in a, in a curved shape, so that uh, it doesn't, you know, tug on the tail. Think about a dog on a leash, but doesn't tug on the tail of the ROV uh, on the seafloor, so we can do delicate maneuvers. And where else can you go to get a unit like pound meters? Interesting but obscure science facts are us, not all is life. We attribute that to our brilliant Canadian support engineer, John Zan. Shout out to John for nailing the um, predicted tension weights. It was, uh, it was right there. Absolutely so many people that contribute to this work. You know, in, a, in a given year, there may be about 200 people, that different people that come out and sail on Nautilus, but hundreds and hundreds that support the work. Uh, the staff of Ocean Exploration Trust is only about 17 people um, year round, uh, but through our contractors, our collaborators, our um, agency partners, permitting partners, funding partners, outreach partners, schools all around the world that work with us. Um, so happy to be able to extend this this reach out and out. And it's like as soon as you start listing someone, you know you haven't listed them all. But uh, if you are listening, if you are here on these dives with us, if this place has touched your heart, if you've come to honor these stories here with us, just thank you for being here. And um, none of this work happens without all of us. Yeah, absolutely, Megan, and obviously also none of this work happens with the, without the support of our generous sponsors. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that this and several other expeditions this year are sponsored by NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, 
through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, uh, a uh, consortium of oceanographic institutions that the Ocean Exploration Trust, uh, along with the University of Rhode Island, University of New Hampshire, University of Southern Mississippi, and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is a proud member to advance the core mission of NOAA Ocean Exploration, namely to map and characterize the U.S. Uh, exclusive economic zone and adjacent waters to train the new next generation of ocean explorers and stewards, as well as to test and integrate new and emerging technologies in the way we do exploration and that way accelerate the pace by which we gain new understanding of this large and still big unknown that 70% of the surface of our Earth, most of which is in deep waters in which we know very little about. Yeah, great question for folks about how they could get more involved um, if you're interested. Uh, one of the ways is in our Scientist Ashore network. So I encourage you to check out NautilusLive.org if you're over on YouTube. Um, but if you are on Nautilus Live, click, check out the science. You can learn more about the types of interdisciplinary science that we do in the deep sea, um, about our cruise planning process, our expedition planning process, where we solicit input. Um, based on the specific priorities and targets of our expedition funders and the science community design expeditions. And uh, there are ways to sign up there um, to lend your expertise and share, share your knowledge with us if you're interested. So uh, our Scientist Ashore program is always growing with people either interested in contributing during expeditions or with the analysis of data afterwards. Certainly when we think about our, our biological and geological exploration, there's really true of anything, you know, and coming to sea with a team of 50 would be truly impossible to have experts in every single thing we might possibly encounter in our oceans. And we rely on the expertise and uh, dedication of scientists and experts ashore long after expeditions. We often are learning things based on our footage and samples one, two, five, ten years after expeditions as the pace of learning continues to advance. So. If you uh, do have that specific expertise and would like to be part of it, I um, encourage you to check out the Scientists Ashore program. If, you're interest, if you are an educator or a student and you're interested in joining our expeditions, uh, we also run our science and engineering internship program where we have at-sea internships in ocean science, seafloor mapping, ROV engineering, and video engineering. Applications for those programs for the 2024 season will open in October. So if you would like to join a mission in that way, highly recommend you either sign up for our newsletter now on the website or follow us on social media to be the first to know when those applications open. Um, the Science Communication Fellowship is also open to formal or informal educators to be in the role that Kara is in here to help uh, connect audiences all around the world to the science and to the seafloor. 
Kara, how did you first uh, learn about the Science Communication Fellowship? Yeah, um, basically I had been um, a viewer of Nautilus Live previously, the live stream and also highlights, um, and kind of got familiar with uh, Ocean Exploration Trust that way, and um, also was developing myself as an educator. So like you said, um, formal educators and informal educators can apply. So in my work, I'm really more of an informal, meaning I'm um, not in a like K-12 classroom, but more so just uh, specifically I work on um, ocean education as part of the Guam Coral Reef Initiative and um, as a part of other organizations in the past. So I have a little bit of a more focus on one particular type of education and a lot of our students are coming in for like field trip programs or um, we're doing like classroom visits or creating resources for teachers. Um, so as I kind of developed some of those um, experiences and got to learn about the Science Communication Fellowship on um, Nautilus's uh, webpage and also hearing um, input from uh, other Science Communication Fellows uh, in the streaming and um, when they share their about their experiences on social media. So kind of just got to know about the position um, slowly through using <laughs> using Nautilus Live in my education work and viewing it and then uh, thought I would apply and uh, try to uh, learn about, um, learn more about communication and more about all sorts of different marine science fields and a, um, be a part of this amazing community on board the ship. So it's really been such a privilege and honor to be here and um, get to know everyone and learn from everybody. And um, definitely such an amazing uh, once in a lifetime experience. We love having you here. Thank you for sharing. Mia, how's our move doing? Yeah, we just called it another move um, two minutes ago. So another 10 meters at 300 degrees. OK, sounds good. And then I was wondering, we've just been going along. Did you want to zoom in on anything? Uh, it's, it's been pretty um, It's been pretty flat here. Um, I'm trying to see, like, we can get we can get a sense of the uh, the hull, but I haven't seen any damage yet. Um, we, we will call for that if you know, as stuff comes up, I'm trying to get a sense of where we are on the on the wreck, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, there may not be all that much that's recognizable um, along this side because all of the the recognizable stuff was uh, up higher on the decks. This is mostly, um, you know, broken off hull and interior spaces. For sure. Yeah, I just wanted to ask since we've been just going along quietly. And I know we're still figuring things out and uh, apologies also if you may have gone through this area already and um, made notes about it, but do we know what those two like larger structures um, kind of vertically coming off the ship are? Uh, I don't, but my guess is they might be some kind of vent. Mm, okay. Or like um, duct pipe and ducting system. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'd say UVS, unidentified vent structure.
And we had an earlier question. Um, since we don't have the two lasers on this dive because we are using Atalanta, um, and those lasers would be 10 centimeters apart, but um, we don't have them here. Um, for those, y either the vent structure or maybe the, it looks like there's like a level below us. Can you give us an idea, if you have one, of um, maybe how a person would size up in this? Would a person be about as tall as that vent? I I'm really honestly not sure. Okay, so still figuring it out. Eighty meters to the to the bow. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I think I. Th we're yeah, I think we are slightly past midships. Looks like there might be something falling over on the deck uh, to our right. That's funny, I was actually thinking to ask you to zoom out briefly to show us, and you did, without asking. I feel like we're becoming more in tuned the longer we work together. Bridge, Nav. Roger. Can we please step one, one zero meters at two eight five? Thank you. We've had some uh, some chatter on the science and uh, on the Nautilus live chats, uh, suggesting that these two square boxes or vents could be boiler uptakes. Um, we were thinking that, that we might be a little bit too far forward, that those are more midships, but really we, we could be at those spots because um, the uh, the stack was uh, probably about this spot, you know, m slightly forward of a midships. Um, so this could have been the lower uptake for maybe the, the vent that brought um, the, the the smoke out of the stack, Some, something related to, to that venting. Can we zoom on that lattice structure on the hull? I think I feel like it might be a. Uh, yeah, I think it might be a. Um, just the internal structure after a plates come loose. Hmm. I don't think it's. Um, it's a torpedo hole because we would have seen the internal structure uh, damage as well. I think that I think there was a hull plate covering that. Yeah. And just jumping in here to add on um, part of 
Ocean Exploration Trust's mission to share exploration uh, with the world is also um, our ship to shore program where we call into classrooms. I'm about to go uh, uh, share about our exploration journey and the science that's going on here with a classroom soon. So I'm going to jump off, but I'm going to pass uh, this uh, position off to Else. Thanks, Kara. Thank you, Kara. Thanks, Kara. See those wires? The degaussing wires? You know what I'm thinking. <laughs> I do. Oh, I'm, I'm happy you asked. <laughs> On a lot of ships of this era, warships, you'd see a series of two, three wires wrapped around the whole hull on the exterior, usually low down, but not beneath the waterline. And when you charge those wires, there was a way to do that to reduce the magnetic signature of the vessel. If we were to turn those on now, maybe our compass would work. Yeah, let's do that. <clears throat> Mia, you're off SPL if you intend to be on it. Uh, no, I'm conferring with Dan and, and the bridge. Thank you, though. Bridge nav. Can we please step zero five meters bearing two one zero? Two one zero. Thank you. So for any viewers just tuning in, we are currently inside of Papa Hanamokuakea Marine National Monument, which right. is located in the sacred realm of Po, or the, of the ancestors of the native Hawaiian people. We are currently conducting a non-invasive video documentation of the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga, which was sunk during the 1942 Battle of Midway. And we are conducting this survey using uh, Atalanta, our ROV onboard Nautilus, which is rated for depths of 6,000 meters. We are currently at 5,400 meters or about three miles 
beneath the ocean. So continue along with us as we explore this wreck and bear witness to a site where um, many servicemen gave their lives. So according to our maritime archaeologists on board, um, when we began, when we first came upon the wreck, we landed on the port side. And we have uh, since we moved from port uh, aft towards the stern, have rounded the stern and are now moving towards the bow along the starboard side. Over the past weekend, we completed dives on the USS Yorktown, as well as the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Akagi, and now we are here on aircraft carrier Kaga. And correct me if I'm mistaken, uh, Mike and Hans, um, we are seeing a lot more damage on this one, or this this aircraft carrier sustained more damage than the other two that we had seen previously. Sorry, can you, can you hold up a sec? Uh, what are you saying, Dan? Okay. Really?
Nautilus Shore. Yeah, go ahead. Mike, we just wrapped up the event here. Uh, I would say very successful. You guys, you know, you know, doing all of this very much at the center. A lot of attention, a lot of interest. Uh, really supported the cause, so thank you. Great. Uh, Japanese Japanese team just left. They were highly impressed, and I think it was a good mo moment. Uh, the administrator. Duck spin red, very pleased, very impressed. Uh, so all around, yeah, bravo Zulu. Awesome. Where you guys are now, yeah. Have, are you still on the starboard side? Are we still what? On the starboard side. Yeah. Okay. Do you have an idea of your position? Uh, I think we're in terms all... of what relative distance to bow. I think we're almost exactly midships. Okay. Any recognizable features that have come up? No, I don't. Not not in a little while. Okay. How do you guys feel about making a more you know a move? Um, how long have you been here? We're 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 going as quickly as we can. Things are going very slowly. Understood. That wasn't a question of rushing you. It was just a question of, you know, your sense of the next space or post to go. Yeah. We haven't tried to cross the hall, right? No, we have not. Okay. Where would you guys like to take this in terms of next step? I mean, obviously, we continue to progress. On the side, how much more time do we have left in the dock? Um, I think about seven hours. Um, seven I, hours? Yeah, we're, yeah. Uh, they've adjusted it a little bit. So I think we're going to be continuing to go to the bow, come around. We only started at midships on the port side, so we need to cover that area. I'm thinking then to come across, look at the debris on the on the starboard side, and then whatever time's left, we look at the interior. So, one of the things that is of interest to us all here is that larger piece of debris that is off that side. Yep. Is that what you're thinking of also going to? After we finish the circumference, yeah. <laughs> About 100 meters away. Right, which is why I don't want to do it first because we don't we would lose we would lose sonar contact with the wreck. Understood. Okay. Everybody's cool here. I just we just wanted to have a contest. Now yeah. That the, uh, yep. Great. The event is uh, hi, uh, can I just make a comment? This is Randy from Japan. Yeah, of course. Hey, hi, Randy. Randy. Yeah, I just want to mention that uh, around 12 o'clock noon at Japan, a lot of people will probably have like a lunch break from their uh, work. So I think there should be more people uh, you know, turning in to the Nautilus Live on that time. So uh, I would uh, hope if we have like a good... <laughs> good view of good scene around like a noon time japan other than like uh, trying to just have like a monotonous scenery it would be great if you can i'm not sure what's going to happen but it, it would be great if we can see you know something really great during the lunch hours uh here so just uh just have that in mind uh of course it depends on a lot of different factors right so, that's just two and a half hours from now Yes, it is nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So two and a half hour. Okay. So just have that in mind. Yeah. And uh, that mind, that it could be. Of my... oh, go ahead. Yeah, we um, w with any luck, maybe we'll be at the bow area at that time. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. And uh, there might be some uh, question uh, uh, coming in through my. Uh, 
know, Twitter and Facebook and stuff around that time, I might have some uh, questions from Japanese viewers. So. That'd be good, just to relay those, yes. Mm -hmm. that Thank you. Yes. Good. Thank you, Randy. <coughs> okay, well, Mike, that's it. we're good. We're going to continue to watch here. You guys are doing good. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Mia, yeah, how are we doing on the with the ship movements? Okay. Okay, understood. Yeah. Roger. Dan, we have a request from our shoreside team to pan left. Is it a good time to do that? No, he, we mean the, uh, the camera. Huh. Sorry, what's that? Yes. Oh, you're talking to SPL, though, I think. Or maybe you're just talking directly to me. Oh, okay. We can't hear you on SPL. Okay.
Nav, how's the ship shaking out? Yeah, we just were talking about that. Um, I think it's going to be maybe another 10 minutes, maybe a little less. Okay. So I'll say 10 minutes, and then if we're less than that, it'll be a uh, positive. Okay, let me know. Oh, no, no. You can talk. I, I had to turn you guys off for a moment um, just when Dan and I were talking, but yeah, no. Go, go. Feel free. If I need to say anything, I'll either mute you or say, uh, can I please cut in? So thank you for asking, though. Okay, so while um, our operations are continuing as we do very delicate maneuvers across um, the wreck that we're looking at, which is the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga, um, can I maybe ask uh, Upashana just to give sort of a quick overview of what um, life we've been seeing so far on this wreck? Uh so far, the couple of hours I have been on this ship, we have mostly seen some uh, sea anemones. Uh, and in the water column swimming by, there was uh, sea cucumber once or twice uh, in the genus Enipniastis. But other than that, we haven't been seeing much uh, faunal composition on, the, on this wreck so far. Awesome, thank you. So we did see quite a lot of, um, like right when we landed on the Yorktown, we saw quite a lot of biota on there, and we saw a little less on Akagi, and then now would you say we're seeing even less uh, here on Kaga? I uh, will refrain from commenting on that because uh, I, we ha I have just seen a part of the wreck, not the other side of it. So uh, in the distance that we have covered in the last two, two and a half hours, this is what I have seen. Okay. But that's not enough to compare with the other two wrecks okay. for sure. Okay. That's fair. Mm -hmm. And Hans, uh, so right now on the screen, just for viewers that are just tuning in, we are looking at, um, it does look like a bit of damaged metal debris. Um, would it be accurate to say that? Could we expand on that? Or is that sort of just what's um, on there right now? What it's looking like to us ashore is clearly a bunch of stuff that is piled up through the movement of the ship and maybe it's settling into the sink. The wheels, uh, carts, most likely, or if some of the other folks ashore can also chime in, but there's a variety of things that move on carts, including bombs. So we're in the area where the hangar would have been. So clearly deck equipment possibly hangar equipment. And again, just a reminder of just how violent the destruction of this vessel was, because we're just seeing a jumble of machinery, ship parts, you name it. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Shore Team.
also I remember you saying earlier, Hans, that this ship took four to five um, direct hits as well as some indirect hits. Um, so we are just across the survey, we're seeing the extent of that damage. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what it looks like. The consistent um, structural damage over all the areas we've seen so far. There doesn't seem to be one area that has less damage and more structure atop than others. Right, and um, you did say, or maybe I missed it or misheard that we believe the top two, like the, all the upper decks are gone and we're looking at the just the hull and what remains underneath that. Yeah, I think we're looking at the level of the deck above the engineering spaces. Mm, okay. And I don't think we've seen any of the intact multiple level hangar structure that would have been above here. Okay. Are we looking at a bird's eye view right now of the, we are on top and looking down or um, just sort of orienting us to the wreck? A little bit of both. Okay. We're, we're kind of uh, have a camera angled at the starboard side towards what's left of the edge of the ship near the midship section. Okay, okay. Uh, Nav? Go ahead, Mike. Hey, so we're, um, I just chatted with Jim and Hans. Uh, we're going to adjust the plan slightly. Okay. So there's, um, uh, there's a, a large piece of uh, wreckage and debris that's uh, about 100 meters off of the starboard. Like if, we, if we're facing the, the wreck and we turn 180, it should be straight out from us. Um, we'd like, that's a really important thing to see because the other dives from uh, 2019 didn't go there. And since we're at the, we're about clo we're the closest we're going to get here, we're thinking to, to pop over there, understanding it'll take a little while, um, and then come back to the wreck. Can we spin to put our back to the wreck and see if we can get in the sonar? Okay, let me talk with Dan. Yeah. So if the strike is at one ten. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Well, I'm not entirely. Or how confident in we are we in your uh, your heading there? Yeah. So I. Yeah. So I had written down at the beginning of the dive that the ship was at a hundred and ten degree bearing, um, which would put us at about like 200 and 190 uh, as being perpendicular. That's, yeah, no, 160, like 160. Um, is there a way for us to confirm the orientation before moving? Yeah. Yeah. Scale of the rings, Mike. But not let's put the scale on your sonar ring. Um, so, but that's a. Uh, Are those 10 meter or 20 meters? St stand by short, please. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with. Yeah. Forty-five sounds good in that case. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Roger that. Yeah, we can watch it coming in on the uh, on the sonar anyway. All right, I'll call it in. Thanks. Bridge nav, can we please go zero four zero at zero four five? Thank you so much. Yeah. Yep, no, that sounds good. I just wanted to double check first before I got lost. Thanks. Uh, sorry, Jim, go ahead, sure.
Um, Mike, we have a question in the chat. If now might be an okay time, or we can come back to it later. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. So, um, our viewer was just wondering if there is any risk um, posed by unexploded ordinances, or um, would that not be a consideration? Um, there were a few uh, five-inch shells that we saw on USS Yorktown. Um, generally, I don't consider that uh, much of an issue because um, most of the active bombs were, were detonated in the uh, during the attack, and anything that was not is probably well inside the the hull. So th there's not. We're, we're not doing anything inside the wreck, so, or touching it, so there, there's really no danger to, to the vehicle for that. Okay, thank you. Great explanation and good to know. For just a little more uh, context on previous exploration done on this wreck, which is the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga, in, it was sunk in, uh, in 1942, and in 1999, a joint expedition between Nauticus Corporation and the U.S. Naval Oce Oceanographic Office searched um, this entire um, region of the seafloor, which is known as where the Battle of Midway happened. And um, they located a large piece of wreckage, which was subsequently identified as part of the upper hangar deck of Kaga. And then more recently in 2019, a team from Vulcan Inc. and the Uni United States Navy conducted mapping um, during an expedition aboard um, research vessel Petrol, and a target was identified using sonar. And then it was dove upon um, uh, in a shorter dive using an ROV. And then uh, now in 2023, we are here conducting a uh, more detailed archaeological assessment of the wreck. And um, as we've heard, we will now also be exploring some wreckage located, or a debris field located farther away from the wreck. Nautilus, sure party. Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Mike, we want to just talk, stop for a second here. Do you, have you seen what happened to this hull plate? Yeah. The question here, you know, just Jeff was talk, we were just talking, this is possibly torpedo damage. Yeah. So um, before we go, because the record is very quiet as to where exactly the scuttling torpedoes hit, um, I'd like to come up a little bit, and if before we shift anywhere else, if we can move a little more to the right, I'd like we'd like to get a really good hard look at this, okay? Uh, oh, particularly oh. be able to look back that one. Okay, that, that's going to that's going to require stopping the ship and coming back because we've already started moving. Do you want to do that? Yeah, I would add a, a significant time. I know. Oh, I was just letting him know. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Jim, do you want to do that? Shoreside, do you want us to stop the move and come back to that? Yep, yeah, roger that. Jim, we'll try to come back to this.
Yep, thank you. Oh my God. Just a good morning, good afternoon, good evening to viewers who might just be tuning in with us here on Nautilus Live. Um, we have viewers from all over the world, including the United States, Japan, Australia, United Kingdom, Germany, Belgium, Ukraine, Slovenia, Norway, Malaysia, Guam, and France. So welcome everyone. We are currently diving um, three miles or 5,400 meters or more than 18,000 feet um, beneath the surface of the Pacific Ocean on a, a wreck of the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga. And um, this feat of exploration, which is getting us glimpses of a battle waged decades ago, is not an easy task and has been the culmination of efforts and collaboration um, between di different disciplines, different institutions, and different countries um, in order to bring us here uh, on the screen. these lines here be a sign of something dragging across the seafloor um, or potentially just bioturbation from maybe those sea cucumbers we were seeing swimming around in the water column? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, sedimentation is really, really low here, so these marks could be from a long time ago, but I, I don't think there is anything related to the wreck that would have caused that. Thanks. Because if, if they were cables, we would still see them, you know? Right.
Okay, thank you. On the, on the, on the what? Why? Oh, I see. Oh, oh, I thought you meant the, the angle. What, what was the angle? 45? Mia, what angle was it? 45? Oh, sorry. I, uh, yeah, angle 45. Okay. I should say bearing 45. Maybe, but it's, yeah, I don't know that there's, if, if stuff would drag without and still move that far, but it's possible, I suppose. Hmm. Well, I mean, this site was explored in 2019. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Uh, if it was like a artifact of their exploration. Bridge nav. Can we step to zero at zero four five? Thank you. <laughs> 